The following is a college course based on the textbooks Marketing and Marketing the Core, written by Karen Berkowitz Hartley and Rodelius, and published by McGraw Hill Irwin Publishers. The fact that Mother's Market and Kitchen is meeting its customers' needs isn't coincidental. Retailers today are savvy marketers, masters of the distribution channels that link customers to goods and services in the marketplace. In the channel of distribution, retailing involves the selling of goods and services to consumers for personal or household use. Simply put, retailing brings customers and products together. Most retailers, like Mother's Market and Kitchen, target a sub-segment of the overall market, commonly called a market niche, and select the assortment of products and services that niche will buy. We're really a specialty food store. The vast majority of foods that we sell are free of chemicals, free of arti preservatives, artificial colors, artificial flavors, those types of things. And I think pretty much every category within a typical grocery uh, department is covered. We have the largest selection of vitamins of just about any retailer that I'm aware of. Pretty much complete line of shampoos and conditioners and cream rinses and makeups. We have vegetarian cat and dog foods for people who want to uh, provide that for their animals. Retailers create value for consumers through the benefits or utilities they provide. For example, Mother's Market emphasizes the time, place, possession, and form utilities by offering its customers the wide variety of alternative foods they prefer in a timely fashion within target locations. But most retailers do not produce the goods they sell. They buy them. And from whom they buy is vital to their success. To keep a variety of product in their stores, retailers typically form partnerships with many different intermediaries, which facilitate the flow of goods from producers to customers. Some of these intermediaries perform the wholesaling function, which involves buying products from manufacturers for later resale to retailers. Most are merchant wholesalers, meaning they own their businesses and the products they sell. For instance, Mother's Market receives many of its products from Nature's Best, a full-service merchant wholesaler. Our customers are primarily independently owned health and natural food stores, uh, natural products superstores, conventional supermarkets, and drug stores. We carry about 20,000 different items, uh, a lot of different product categories, uh, refrigerated products, frozen, grocery items, nutritional supplements, herbs, uh, personal care items, uh, uh, bulk and institutional sizes, and non-food products. We derive many benefits from, from Nature's Best. Um, first of all, just pricing. Because we do, we focus a lot of our buying through them, uh, we're able to get better pricing than we would if we were working through two or three or more distributors to buy the same uh, types of products. They bring in new products. They uh, provide us with reports uh, that show uh, what our top sellers are, reports that show um, how our top sellers compare to their top sellers as an entire company, uh, which helps us to see where we might have some opportunities to bring in products or do better with products maybe that, that we're not doing so well with or that we're not even carrying. When we transmit our orders to them, we can actually transmit it to their website, and then we can actually go and edit that order to make sure that we're picking up all the sale items that we need to pick up. It'll tell us what items are on sale, which items aren't on sale, and then on the items that are on sale, for example, we can beef up those, uh, uh, those orders to make sure that we're maximizing our margins. We're committed to cost savings uh, as a wholesaler to both the manufacturing side 
and, and the retailing side. If, if, you've, if you've got you know, a thousand manufacturers over here and you've got a thousand retailers over here, you can imagine if the chaos if each of those thousand retailers were trying to place separate orders with each of those thousand manufacturers and those thousand manufacturers trying to ship products to a thousand different retailers. We're that guy right in the middle between those, those two, between the manufacturer and the retailer. We buy it from the manufacturer, bring it into our warehouse, and then we can sell their product to those thousand retailers. And thousand retailers just have one source they need to go to to buy those products. Smaller, limited service merchant wholesalers serve mothers too, such as rack jobbers, who supply their own products and maintain the racks or shelves that display them. These wholesalers charge only for the products that are purchased. We use a number of, of jobbers and they, um, they basically take care of their products in the store. So they'll do the ordering, uh, they'll bring the product in, they'll stock it, they'll price it. For example, we have a lot of juice companies uh, that will, they supply their own case and they keep it full. They'll come in uh, two or three times a week um, and they'll stock it and they'll take care of it. Retailers use agent and broker intermediaries as well. Different from merchants, agents and brokers facilitate deals between two parties without taking ownership of the good or service. For example, manufacturer's agents, used frequently in the food industry, represent a group of manufacturers that carry non-competitive goods in an exclusive territory. A good manufacturer rep will come in, take a look at how the product's being merchandised, make sure that it's, it's positioned properly, um, that uh, the products are in stock, that we're carrying the right products, that we have the products on the shelf that we should have, uh, given our mix, and they would make product mix suggestions, maybe tell us, give us pricing ideas. Uh, you know, we're high for the market, we're low for the market. Um, so they'll, um, they can be very valuable. Unlike agents, brokers often do not have a long-term relationship with the buyers and sellers they bring together for a sale. For example, a healthcare product manufacturer wanting to get its new product on the shelves of a supermarket chain would employ the services of a broker who has contacts within that chain. However, Mothers has enjoyed several long-term relationships with brokers who entered the niche market years ago and grew with the health foods market. Just like there are distinct types of wholesalers, there are different classifications of retailers as well. For instance, the form of ownership can distinguish stores based on whether they're independent, corporate chains, franchises, or club warehouses. Mother's Market and Kitchen, for example, is privately owned and it currently has four stores. Retailers also vary by their merchandise line, defined by the breadth and depth of the products they carry. A large chain supermarket like Safeway is known for its breadth of product line, meaning it carries a wide selection of different products. Safeway, for instance, offers a broad variety of milk and meat products, fresh and frozen prepared foods, health and beauty aids, as well as photo processing, florist arrangements, and a fresh bakery. Its sweeping range of different product categories is extensive. On the other hand, a specialty supermarket like Mother's is known for its depth of product line, meaning it offers a substantial assortment of a related line of items. We have a fairly narrow range of products, um, but within that small niche, I think we have a, a wide selection of products within the niche, and uh, I think that's really where we um, where we excel. Um, vegetarian foods, I don't think you can find a better selection of vegetarian foods, for example. Low-carb foods uh, for things like the Atkins diet, organic foods, vitamins. I'm certain no one has more products than we have. A lot of the items that we sell are available in the supermarkets, but what you don't get is the selection. Soy milk, for example, is available in every dairy counter, uh, whether you're in a supermarket or here. But here you'll have, we'll have uh, four different varieties of soy milk, and we'll have six different flavors, and uh, you won't find that in a typical supermarket. So. Again, that's one of the ways that, that we differentiate ourselves.
And I have some soy protein, and mm -hmm. I wanted to know if there's anything better than what you have generically in your own. Uh, okay, good. Okay. All right, the, the protein powder... Another way to classify retailers is through the level of service they provide. For instance, many gas stations offer a good example of self-service retailing. General merchandise stores like Walmart and Target are limited service operations because they honor credit, merchandise returns, and provide limited sales assistance in certain departments. But they don't offer other services such as alterations. Then there are full service retailers like Mothers with personnel trained to assist customers with special needs. We do uh, pride ourselves in having uh, in being um, full service relative to having people who are knowledgeable about the products. If you come into our vitamin department or body care department, those are our full service. I would say it's probably the most intensive customer service situation that you can get. Some people have, you know, some health conditions and we're without a doubt not doctors, not qualified in any way to give medical advice. But what we can do is, is guide people in the areas that may be suitable for, the, for what they're looking for. If someone has a cold or a flu, we have products that traditionally over many years have been used. Training is probably one of the most important things about your business. When customers come in, they would love to feel very confident that your people know what's going on and they can talk to them and they're getting the right answers. We're always talking about what's good in season, what's next, haven't you tried this, would you like to, and this goes great with that. We're conscious of the product and who grew it, which is not what you can get from a chain store. You walk in and ask him who grew it, what's in it, and how does it taste, and he'll have to look at that box. The juice bar and the restaurant, I think, um, really add a unique uh, element to our store. We actually have an amazing juice bar, and it's a fresh fruit juice bar, and uh, people comment on it, and they come in specifically for that. And the same with the restaurant. Uh, there are very few natural food restaurants out there that um, are reasonably priced and that uh, provide a wide selection of vegetarian foods. Though that category is growing, and you're going to start seeing, I think, uh, vegetarian fast food restaurants are going to be popping up. In planning a marketing strategy, successful retailers also work with the retailing mix, which involves the goods and services, physical distribution, and communication tactics they choose for their stores. In marketing their goods and services, Managers consider such factors as variety and assortment, customer services, pricing, and a store's image and atmosphere. Retailers, for example, are continually adjusting their pricing based on the dynamics of their marketplace at any given moment. You don't like to be the highest priced guy in town, and you don't like to be the lowest price, but you've got to maintain your quality. I like to look at the price and what everybody else is doing, and I try to maintain lower than them. Okay, and I try to drive that price home to the customer to let them know that when you come here, not only are you going to get quality, you're going to get price too. We'll have a lot of everyday low pricing products, and then we'll lower those even more. Um, we'll have some products that we're offered a very, very deep discount from the manufacturer, and we may just keep the margin on that product if it sells. A lot of it's to do with the movement of the product. Um, we obviously have keep a very keen eye out on what our competitors are doing. We always try to have something uh, in one of the brands that if someone's looking for it and they're looking for a cheap price, we've got it somewhere. Somewhere in the store they can find the product they're looking for below what they could get it elsewhere. Ultimately, the retailer works to set prices that maintain a healthy gross margin or gross profit which is the difference between the final selling price of a product and the retailer's cost of the product sold. Margins differ depending on the type of product. There's kind of like, I would say, three different levels of price sensitivity. There's kind of a high level of price sensitivity like baby food, soy milks. Those are the items that you, you need to be very aware of what your competition is doing. Then there's kind of a medium level of price sensitivity. These are items that aren't terribly price sensitive, but they're higher volume items. Peanut butter, mayonnaise, mustard, ketchup, condiments. 
of things that people are using every day. And there's much more specialty stuff. They don't move very fast, but they're still taking up shelf space. And so typically you would make higher margins on those items. Another consideration for retailers in maintaining an adequate margin is shrinkage, which refers to a store's loss in merchandise due to breakage or theft. And the reason for it could be numerous. Um, it could be employees uh, mishandling the product, it breaks, customers breaking items. Um, it could be um, uh, things that are stolen, uh, you know, either by customers or by employees. Uh, it could be product that, that uh, you have to sell at a lower margin because you ordered too much and you need to move it or, or you have to sell it before it goes bad. Example would be in the deli. Uh, typically salad would only have a, maybe a two or three day shelf life. You would um, hope to have a higher margin because you're going to end up throwing some of that stuff away or, or having to sell it at a lower margin because you're having to put it on sale so you can turn it before it goes bad. Marketers consider physical distribution factors in the retailing mix as well, which can include store location, warehousing, and transportation choices. Store location is a big consideration. Will the outlet do best in a regional shopping center where a planned mix of stores benefits all retailers, or a central business district in a community's downtown shopping area where there's a lot of foot traffic? Mother's Market is located in a strip location also called a strip mall, which includes a group of different stores that serve people within a five to 10 minute drive. Parking is absolutely a key ingredient to the success of a business. Um, again, ingress and egress, how easy it is to get in and out of the center, how much visibility there is uh, from the street. You'd like to have as much frontage as you can. You'd rather have a wide store than a deep store because you want that, again, better presence from the streets. We like being in centers. Um, because of the um, synergy uh, derived from having other businesses um, there and uh, people coming for one business and then looking at your store and saying, hey, maybe I can get this there also. The estimated size of a particular market area and its demographic characteristics such as age, occupation and income are also important location considerations. For instance, Mother's Market wanted to open its third store in the master-planned community of Irvine for years, but refrained until Irvine's population and income levels grew substantially to support it. Uh, supermarkets, when looking for sites, will look very closely at income levels and will look very closely at how much families are spending on food. If the available food dollars currently, for instance, uh, uh, in Irvine, I saw markets that didn't make it. Uh, I took, it was almost uh, 20, uh, 19 or 20 years before I would go there, even though people were clamoring for us, some people were clamoring for us to be there. Uh, I knew that we couldn't survive because all of the information that we had uh, surrounding the food dollars available uh, couldn't support us, wouldn't support us. The final portion of the retailing mix, communications, is critical. Whether conveyed directly through salespeople or indirectly through advertising, displays, or websites, a retailer's communication strategy is key to moving a customer toward a purchase. We have a lot of people that really need personal assistance. They need you to take them and show them where things are and talk to them about this product. and you know. What is a wheat-free bread? You know, people, you know, they have food allergies, and all of a sudden their doctor says, well, you have to go and get products without wheat, and they're going, oh, my God, how do I do that? You know, what doesn't have wheat in it? What breads don't have wheat? So um, it's actually very rewarding to be able to take these people and take them on a walk through the store and show them that they're not going to starve. We just recently added a kind of a, an information kiosk uh, to the store where people can go up, and you can dial in anywhere from... Uh, uh, particular diseases, uh, symptoms, uh, you can put in uh, particular foods and products uh, and actually dial down to getting specific information about whatever it is you're interested in and they can print out their own little 
uh, sheet that has the information there. That is a key part of our business is providing people with information. We have some seminars where we have over 100 people. It's really fun and, and uh, I think it's a great way for us to, uh, to get our name out and, and uh, to get people to come to the store that might not come to the store otherwise. Displays are very important. Um, the way you display the product um, is sometimes even more important than the pricing it can be. You want to keep your displays moved around. Um, you can have a really nice display if you keep it in the same spot for more than sometimes a few weeks or a couple of months it just it becomes old um, so you can see sometimes a product that's not moving in one area you move it to another area and it starts selling basically we take uh, most of our ends in the various departments and we use those to promote um, sale items to promote new items and you want people to see these things Produce, for example, we have right out front as you walk in because we want people to see the quality of our produce because we really have great produce. Vitamins and body care, for example, we have some great um, items over there and a lot of our, some of our customers never even go into that area. So I like to make sure that we have certain key items from those departments out in the main body of the store so that people can see that, um, oh, you know, they have shampoos and you know, the things that everybody uses, toothpaste and conditioners, and those products are available here, and um, that, that'll help sales. You know, they'll try one, it'll work, and they'll start buying it from us instead of from the uh, drugstore next door. Retailing is a dynamic and competitive business with innovative store types appearing continuously in pursuit of customers. The Wheel of Retailing describes how new forms of retailers enter the market. While entrants can start anywhere on the wheel, they often begin as low-status, low-margin competitors. When mothers began in the 1970s, the natural foods available today were unheard of. In fact, the term natural foods usually meant granola. When we started, those people who wished to follow a vegetarian diet, to try it, couldn't eat out, ever. There wasn't any place to eat out. I'm talking about 1978. So we started the restaurant right in the beginning. Growing with the support of the 70s counterculture, Mother's expanded its business to include the selling of more products, such as vitamins, juices, and other organic foods. With these additions, Mother's prices, margins, and status began to rise, causing its wheel to turn. As time passed, mothers added even more products and services, raising their prices, margins, and status still higher, and its wheel turned again. Today, Mother's Market and Kitchen's full-service stores offer customers a natural alternative for nearly all mainstream foods on the market, from refrigerator and frozen products to grocery, personal care items, even non-food products. And the changes leave room for new forms of outlets, like a small vegetarian restaurant, offering only the basics at a lower cost until it adds products and services, prompting its wheel of retailing to turn. Another way to examine the changing dynamics of the retail marketplace is to look at an outlet's retail life cycle, which tracks growth and decline over time. For example, in the growth or accelerated development stage, companies focus on the distribution element of the retailing mix, establishing multiple outlets. Market share and profits achieve their greatest growth rates during this time. Mother's Market and Kitchen is in its growth stage. With the rise of warehouse discount clubs and superstores, Americans have become used to rock-bottom prices and all-in-one shopping. But natural food stores like Mother's are leading a new trend, attracting affluent, health-conscious customers who want better service than discounters can give and will pay more for organic food and natural food supplements. It's huge. It's wonderful. And supermarkets are jumping in on it. Drugstores are jumping in on it. Walmart, Kmart. Everybody wants a piece of this new awareness. It involves the ecology. It involves our rivers, our mountains, our air quality. What's interesting is now, for instance, you'll see, you know, in mass market and, and even on TV commercials, um, products like ginkgo biloba or echinacea, which even five, seven years ago were being touted as snake oil. Now it's pretty mainstream.
we're getting ready, especially in the supplement area, for the next step where um, we'll be carrying products that may be considered by mass market and other people to be um, unproven or unrealistic. The growth stage is also the time when more competition enters the marketplace. For instance, mainstream grocery chains battling their maturity phase are currently expanding their organic and natural food offerings in an effort to maintain market share and delay entering the decline stage in which profits fall rapidly. All retailers eventually go through each phase of the retail life cycle. The cycle doesn't change, but the astute marketer can modify the length of time a store spends in each phase. There's constantly new formats arising um, and um, supermarkets picking up more products and you know uh, specialty, other specialty stores opening up and so it's Southern California is a very competitive marketplace and there's a lot of creativity here and um, I think as retailers uh, you just you have to stay on top of things you have to evolve and grow and I think that um, I think we're well positioned to do that it's no accident that mother's market and kitchen has grown steadily and impressively to become a major player in the booming natural products industry Today, successful retailers like Mothers are masters of marketing excellence, meeting their customers' needs now and embracing the changes to come. More simply put, they're bringing the customer and product together.